the Academy of International Business Northeast Chapter and International Business uh, Department, I would like to welcome all of you to this annual symposium of the Academy of International Business Northeast Chapter. Academy of International Business is the premier academic body for professors and researchers who are focused on international business. Last year, we decided that in addition to our annual conference, we will also be hosting an annual symposium, and we decided to focus on the emerging countries. Last year, our focus was Turkey. This year, we decided to focus on China, which, is, which has been growing at an amazing pace. About 200 years ago, Napoleon said that China is a giant, but the giant is sleeping. Let the giant sleep. If it wakes up, it is going to devour the entire world. Now the giant is no longer sleeping, and the rest of the world is looking at China, sometimes with enthusiasm, sometimes with a mixture of envy and fear. So in this forum, we hope that we would get an all-round view about China, about its economy, about its politics, about, about the societal changes that are affecting every part of China. We have a number of distinguished speakers and experts, both from China and from the USA. I would just like to introduce a few guests very briefly, and then later I would be introducing them formally. We have Professor Jonathan Spence, Professor Emeritus of History uh, at Yale University. He'll be uh, delivering the keynote address this morning. We also have uh, uh, Dr. Li Xiaoshen from, from uh, Vice President of Beijing Technology and Business University, who has flown all the way from Beijing. We have Dr. He Mingke from China, uh, also from the same university. We have Dr. Uh, Frank Gao from Tianjin Foreign Studies University, who is also a visiting faculty at Quinnipiac uh, this semester. We have a number of other guests. I will be introducing them later. But first of all, I would like to request our Vice President for Multicultural, Multicultural Affairs and International Education, Dr. Diane Arisa, to come and formally welcome all the guests. Please welcome Dr. Diane Arisa. Good morning. This is a nice crowd. And uh, again, for those of you uh, who are joining us as guests, welcome to Quinnipiac University. I am um, privileged, really privileged to be here among such honorable guests at the Symposium on China. And you know, it's just nice to see some of you having visited uh, Beijing and China last year. It's just nice to have you here today. Uh, I want to especially thank Professors Muhammad Alehi, Shohan Yi, Frank Gao, the School of Business. And I, I get excited when students are excited. And they are here today joining us and have also organized, uh, or at least been a, a great part of this uh, symposium that have been instrumental in, in where, why we're here today. Uh, and I'm going to say a few words about, you know, again, I oversee the multicultural and global initiatives on this campus. And it doesn't mean that I manage everything, because as you can see, all of what's happening today is not because I said you must do. <laughs> Lots of great work is being done within de departments. But I want to say a little bit about what the university, what's the charge for universities today. And I, you know, I work closely with faculty and staff to prepare students for productive and responsible citizenship. This means that preparing students to live and work in a society, and you know this, that increasingly, increasingly operates across international borders we all believe that our graduates must possess, and we're not there yet, but they must possess intercultural skills and competencies to be successful in this globalized world. And higher education, and this is our, our role, higher education institutions must commit to helping students to achieve these outcomes. You know, the question I have every day when I wake up is how do we forge ahead? Quinnipiac is continuing to build an international agenda that incorporates global perspectives into teaching, learning, and research as evidenced 
in the QU curriculum series and funding from the Galpin internationalization grant that continues to support faculty to, to you know, and, and it's mainly for faculty to faculty research, faculty led courses, and study abroad, you know, student service trips for students. What's been impressive in my, and I have only been here two and a half years, but what has been impressive in the last few years is that there's been intense efforts, particularly from the School of Business and the Department of in International Business. Certainly there are other departments on this campus like the Albert Schweitzer Institute and others that have also uh, you know, supported this agenda, is to increase relationships <coughs> and collaboration with people and institutions abroad. With increased formal or informal cooperation agreements, we have begun to think more strategically. And the, I have to underscore, under, underscore strat, strategy about these collaborations and the roles they can play in overall institu institutional internationalization. So I mean, this is the obvious today. Conferences such as the one today um, is a clear, clear example of how Quinnipiac University is continuing to become more globalized and pursuing opportunities to expand their global reach and engage with institutions and students in other countries. Now, unfortunately, you know, you have such a beautiful lineup today with phenomenal speakers, and I can't be here today. But it's only because we have another program of scholars that have come from the University Nacional Autónoma de Nicaragua of León that are here today as microbiologists also seeking opportunities to get, you know, to, to reach and, 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 and partner with each other. So I have to say these are exciting times at Quinnipiac University. So I want to say in closing, on behalf of the university, the Department of Cultural and Global Engagement, I wish you all a productive and successful day. Best wishes. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Uh, before I proceed further, I would like to acknowledge a few people without whose uh, help we wouldn't have been able to organize this program. I would like to acknowledge Professor Shahongha, uh, Treasurer of the Academy of International Business Northeast Chapter, and a professor at the International Business Department. Alisa Thomas, President of the International Business Society, our student club. Uh, David Ives, I saw David somewhere here. Okay, David Ives. He's the executive director of Albert Schweitzer Institute, and usually whenever we organize any program, Albert Schweitzer Institute always becomes a co-sponsor and supports us. We really appreciate uh, your, your help and support. We have uh, uh, Dr. Li Chaoxian, vice president of Beijing Technology and Business University, who has flown from Beijing. I would like to ask him to come to the podium and give his brief remarks. Interpreter. Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. We are very glad to be invited to participate in this simple event today. Thank you very much for uh, taking China as a topic for today. Because of your attention of you of your attention about China and then Chinese development will be very smooth. Thank you very much. Uh, after the discussion today and uh, our research on China, I think we will be very fruitful. And it is also will be helpful for everybody to understand China better. This is my second time to participate in this such, such, uh, such the, the symposium. Every time when I participate and then I enjoy the hospitality, I feel. Oh, yes. 我也想回报大家，因此呢，我们
，希望下一次类似的会议在中国举行，在我们学校举行。Uh, as a result, we would like to uh, apply to hold the such the similar symposium in China. Okay, thank you. Very, in order to thank you very much. Uh, we hope is in the next four or five months. We hope all of you to come to China to learn about Chinese experience. We plan to have uh, have this symposium in China in next April or May, and uh, all the uh, friends present today. You are, we welcome you to participate in the symposium in China next year. If you want to study China and the best place in China. So today, on behalf of BTBU, I formally invite every one of you to participate in the symposium held in, will be held in BTBU next year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lee and Dr. He. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Jonathan Spence. Professor Spence is a British-born historian and public intellectual specializing in Chinese history. He was a Sterling Professor of History at Yale University from 1993 to 2008. His most widely read book is The Search for Modern China, a survey of the last several hundred years of Chinese history based on his popular course at Yale. A prolific author, reviewer, and essayist, Dr. Spence has written a dozen books on China. His uh, most recent interest is, uh, actually his major interest is on Qing Dynasty and also the relations between China and the West. Dr. Spence was educated at Winchester College and at the University of Cambridge. He later obtained his MA and PhD uh, from Yale University in 1965. As a part of his uh, graduate training, he spent a year in Australia in order to study under preeminent scholars of the Qing Dynasty, Fang Chao Ying and Tu Lian She. Widely recognized as a leading scholar of Chinese history, Dr. Spence was president of the American Historical Association for the 2004-2005 term. He has received eight honorary degrees in the United States, as well as from the Chinese University of Hong Kong and from Oxford University. He was invited to become a visiting professor at Peking University and an honorary professor at Nanjing <coughs> University. He was named Companion of the Order of St. Michael and St. George, and in 2006, he was elected as Honorary Fellow of Clare College, Cambridge. Before I invite uh, Dr. Spence here, I would also like to add one more thing. Dr. Spence is known in China as Xi Jingqian, and this name was chosen to reflect his love of history and his admiration for the historian Sima Chien. Please let's, let us welcome Dr. Jonathan Spence. Well, thank you very much for that kind uh, introduction and welcome everybody. Uh, this is an exciting moment for me to be, to be back here. Uh, having visited in the past, and I would certainly not have survived without a guide today. Uh, the transformation of this campus is completely amazing, uh, and I salute all those of you, a few of whom I've met already, who, who made this possible, so that Quinnipiac is firmly and nationally on the map, there's no doubt about it, uh, and is, is consulted and quoted in, in all kinds of things from uh, especially assessments of political world and economic world, uh, but also now for history and law uh, and indeed athletics uh, at different times. So this is a difficult assignment because we have here pretty much everything to cover. Uh, and I know that you have an amazing group of panels uh, through the day. Uh, just autobiographically maybe, uh, I should mention that I'm a, uh, 
convert to Chinese history, what on the board we call resurgent China, the resurgent China, uh, having sort of grown up so much with British history and in, in these, the schools that were mentioned, which were kind of hothouse training grounds, I guess, in the English version for uh, British studies and European studies. But it was in my early 20s that I got uh, completely fascinated by China. Uh, and uh, it was like a dire total direction change for me. And I still don't know quite why. Uh, I remember that um, it seemed to me that pretty much all global history was subsumed either by uh, the European experience or the American experience. Uh, and it took the reading as a child and listening to the stories about the Korean War uh, and then later the Great Leap Forward in, in China made me realize that I simply knew nothing about the underpinning of, of what was going on. Uh, there seemed to be a news lapse. Uh, how is it possible, for instance, for as much as um, five years to go past before some fairly major item was even discussed uh, in, in China? Uh, why, how could there be so uh, so many ways to think and rethink things. Where, where, uh, where did Taiwan fit into this scenario? Where did Britain uh, and all the British history of the 18th and 19th century, how did that, uh, that fit in? And around about 1959, 1960, which we now know was the pinnacle of, of the Great Leap Forward under, under Chairman Mao, uh, I took the to me, a reckless step of, of sort of enrolling in Chinese one uh, and the very, very basic course in Chinese, uh, held uh, uh, in a basement room in, in, in Yale, uh, where I got introduced via a, a Chinese speaker uh, who was uh, now living in America. Uh, she introduced me to the, the, the basic language. And I'm still a student of this, of some 60 years later. Uh, because it is the most absorbing culture and language. Uh, and I think that the one thing that uh, may not emerge from these remarks quite clearly enough is how much interest there is currently uh, in China, in their own culture. That if, if there was a danger of China uh, being swallowed up by the rest of the world, that has now been pushed aside. Uh, and so we have uh, and I'm sure there are many here as well, uh, incredibly good Chinese graduate students, uh, one of whom tragically was one of those who died in the, in, in the Boston Marathon blast. But such, uh, such students, such exchanges and so on have, have really made uh, a meaningful, I think, meaningful interconnection so that we can in this very room be invited to, to continue the discussion in China itself. I find that very a uh, gracious way to pursue the, the discussion. Uh, where should Chinese studies end? Well, uh, I was given the, uh, the, the rather daunting title of the U.S. and China, past, present, and future. Uh, that seems to cover a lot of things. Uh, and I see my role as introducing some of these topics. And uh, it's hardly a keynote because there are so many keynotes here. It's a sort of star-studded cast, so I can just suggest some of the avenues that I, I've pursued as a, as a historian. It's, um, it's always seemed to me that Chinese history uh, goes back so far uh, that we have to kind of cut in. We have to s decide where to slice our, our way in. Uh, and right from the beginning, I was fascinated with 17th century. China. That may seem a bit arcane, but we can talk about that. We have a Q&A time to link to the talk. Uh, but this idea of the 17th century marked China in transition, not necessarily resurgent as the word up there, but it reminds us of how dramatically China was changing and did change in what is often seen as the takeoff period for the Industrial Revolution in terms of uh, British and, and European history. But for China, uh, the 17th century marked the conquest of the last indigenous dynasty, uh, which was known as the Ming, uh, the glorious or the bright dynasty. Uh, 
which collapsed in turmoil and civil war and disaster uh, in the 1630s and 1640s. Um, and there seemed very little interconnection between these dramatic events on the other side of the world uh, and European developments, except for one curious thing which became one of my subjects of study during my teaching life, uh, because there were a handful of Westerners in China all through this Civil War period. Uh, and this reminds us of the complexity of what is known as the missionary impulse because the Westerners in China in this period uh, had all, sorry? This might help a little bit. Oh, okay. I've got one kit here. There you go. Is that all right? Sorry, has, have all this, have you been plunged in silence all this time? <laughs> uh, if so, you're very polite and thank you. And so I, I've now got a fistful of uh, machines here. Uh, and having seen the high-tech level of this uh, school, I, I, I feel humbled by uh, these, these objects. But in any case, we had built-in interpreters for us, and these were the Jesuit missionaries. So the, the idea of foreigners bearing witness to an internal civil war uh, is something that was early in, in China, and you could take that problem way back uh, in time as you, as you think about it. But so that um, when we think of China, when certainly I started studying China, it was true that it seemed almost like a failed country, as we sometimes say. Uh, things were just completely off the rails as far as we could see. We couldn't see what the logic was. Uh, we couldn't see what, where the developmental pattern was going. Uh, even the most radical students of the time couldn't understand exactly what the Chinese meant by Chinese socialism, uh, quite irregardless of, of Mao as, as a political leader. Uh, there, were, there were so many unknowns here that we could justly start, and uh, I decided, we could justly start telling the story of modern China, today's China, uh, around about 1630. This may seem uh, absurd to some of us, but I, I, I find it logical. Now I'm just going to suggest some sort of headlines that came into my mind uh, when I was invited to, to sort of begin uh, the discussions here today. Uh, and I immediately sort of, when I got the invitation, I thought, well, uh, past, present, and future, that's a bit much, uh, and China and, and the United States. Uh, but maybe we could draw them together by looking at some of the ways that the two cultures uh, sort of interacted with each other uh, and began to ask certain kinds of questions. Uh, and in China, those questions are, are being answered now, I think, one by one. Uh, and different uh, things are becoming clear to us, different trajectories are also becoming uh, near to us. And others, though, are more baffling than ever. For those who understand fully the recent <coughs> leadership changes in China, I would say the famous phrase, please come and see me afterwards, uh, after the class is over. What, what exactly has been going on? Uh, we, we, we need skilled people to, to interpret this, both in, in China and in the West and in uh, uh, other centers of, of learning. Now, what would be a sort of a must-think-about a must list? That's just a quick run-through. Uh, if we do US and China, past, present, and future, uh, one uh, place to start is, is, is a date, a simple date. I won't give many dates at all. Uh, but that is the date of um, 1784. Uh, and at the end of the uh, American Revolution and the development of new political system in, in the States, uh, that coincides exactly with the beginnings of China uh, and America in terms of their interrelationship. Uh, because the moment uh, the revolution was, was declared successful, uh, just at that moment in the, in the 1780s, uh, a consortium of American businessmen began to get together, uh, and the idea of trading in China uh, for big business was, was born in, in the United States. Uh, and it was in 1784 that the first uh, registered vessel now by the independent uh, Americans, uh, sailed off for, for China. Uh, it was called, suitably enough, the Empress of China. 
Now that first uh, journey uh, of, um, of Americans into Chinese waters, uh, I think modestly uh, it, uh, it achieved a decent profit, it achieved a 25% profit on the investment. Uh, this was nothing to do with the China, so-called Chinatown world of the later 19th century and so on. This was East Coast American commercial know-how. Uh, and strong investment by the business communities all up and down the East Coast with Boston uh, and Philadelphia and New York uh, all being prominent and many other uh, cities as well. So the China trade was born. Uh, it was born with 25% profit expectations. Uh, it was born by people who were able to buy uh, five or six hundred ton vessels to interrupt, to interdict the trade uh, with the Far East. And it was also right at the beginning of our story, if we're historians and are interested in such a story, that we find a central conundrum in this relationship. And that is, what did America have that China should be expected to need or want to buy? What was, in other words, the market structure that people were getting involved with? And it's an experimental period in the 18th and 19th century uh, as American business sought desperately for things the Chinese would want that were produced uh, in, the, in this country as it began to grow and develop. And it's curious that the only really strong sources of profit, uh, one of them was ginseng, American ginseng, the medicinal herb, uh, and the Empress of China took to China 30 tons of ginseng. That's a lot, uh, even for health nuts. Uh, and that sold well in China. And the other thing was that Chinese winters were stronger than we thought, uh, so that sea otter pelts, uh, the pelts of the sea otter, uh, became one of the great selling points from American products into China. They also began a wave of uh, ecological disasters, uh, because the sea otters were almost wiped out uh, by American uh, desire to, to find a meaningful profit. Um, but there was very little made here, even as the Industrial Revolution began to grind underway, that the Chinese wanted. Well, so we could focus some of our discussion later, if you like, around the, those events, the first, the beginning of this relationship uh, in the 1780s. Then the second group that would follow from this would be those uh, that sort of had linkages uh, between these early merchants uh, and the Qing state, particularly in the commercial Chinese world. So the fact of Chinese merchants emerging who were willing to do business with uh, Americans, uh, this was of course new, uh, and the Chinese looked in vain in their records, their historical records, for the United States, and they couldn't find one. Uh, there was, so they actually used first, uh, and I was reading about this recently, the Americans used British registration to get through the Chinese laws uh, because you couldn't not exist and be a trading partner. Uh, so that um, the, the, Amer the first Americans dealing with China were often doing so under the British flag. Uh, and there was a great deal of confusion uh, in the Chinese bureaucracy, quite justifiably. Uh, to work out how this was going to, it was going to proceed. But it, very rapidly, I think by the later 18th century, uh, we could say that um, there was the beginnings of what we now call a global network. Uh, it was beginning to intersect between the East Coast of the United States, uh, China itself, um, to, in some extent uh, merchants in the East China coast, to some extent traders in the North, there were interconnections with trade through Russia at this time. And so uh, the ideas of the complexity of, of these uh, exchanges were very much part <coughs> of global network thinking. By the end of the 18th century as well, uh, a new problem was emerging, which was that we might call, uh, and I know Kunipiak is, is famous for study of this, we might say comparative law. Uh, the different ways in which countries develop legal structures and uh, develop them for, in most cases, their own advantage. 
and the United States began a series of legal tussles with China that were both financial, excuse me, sir. <coughs> So they began uh, <coughs> fighting over, uh, fighting spiritually, if you like, with paper, pen and paper, uh, about the rights and the laws that would be followed in the various harbors that were being forced open uh, by Western firepower. And that itself is a very complicated system. But the idea of comparative legal battles, uh, whose, whose law, in other words, was going to be dominant uh, when the rights seemed to be on both sides at once? who was going to be the adjudicant uh, in, in such a situation. Uh, and the answer became, uh, first of all, that the Chinese would dominate this process and Westerners would live by Chinese law around about 1790, for instance, 1800. But at the same time, a group of Western traders began to see <coughs> that China was too harsh in its law. In other words, China gave too many, uh, it seemed to, to Americans, gave too easily uh, for the death penalty uh, when evidence was not very strong. And most particularly, China sort of adhered to what, I guess in the Western sense, was called the eye for an eye uh, <coughs> figuration of law, which was that if one person died on one side, another person had to die. Uh, on the other. So in two famous legal cases, the Chinese forced uh, Westerners to give up uh, men who had killed ac Chinese bystanders accidentally. And it led to great bitterness, great confusion, uh, and a renewed search for products. I'm sorry about this. And it was into this gap in the trading system with ambiguity about the legal system that we find something that is certainly that's a topic for discussion if we wish, which is that the answer taken by Britain and America by the early 19th century was that the balance of payments problems, legal problems, traditional problems should be solved by the sale of opium. And so opium uh, which was being produced in the British uh, India uh, and shipped across the sea to China, particularly to Guangzhou uh, and also some of the harbors uh, near what is now Hong Kong. This new kind of uh, issues uh, put uh, the moral wrong uh, very firmly in the Western court, as it were. And China uh, tried uh, in the mid-19th century to boycott all imports of drugs, particularly opium, from the West. <coughs> and they were not able to do it. Uh, the, amount of, the amount of narcotics became so huge uh, that there was a clearly a national crisis in China. And it was so treated by the Chinese government in the, in the 1830s and 40s, <coughs> led to war, and the war was won by the British uh, in alliance with the traders. <coughs> Now that um, brought us into a world in which uh, profits were steady uh, and rising uh, in, in, uh, uh, in, in the United States. Uh, Chinese uh, international sophistication in business grew uh, rapidly. Profits were high, uh, but very risky. Uh, there were certain British merchants might make as much as 50% on their, on their investment. But that was rare, and other, uh, there's been a lot of study recently of the bankruptcy side of this equation, uh, as many, many Chinese merchants went bankrupt, including the famous Hong merchants in, in, the, in the southeast part of China. The reasons for that bankruptcy are, are complex, and many people here may be finance majors and so on, I can, but we could talk about it a little bit later if you wish. Uh, the question was exactly how uh, could the Chinese amass uh, enough capital to start uh, purchasing opium in the s scale they wanted to, while at the same time stopping uh, the abuse of this all over the country. It was a very delicate uh, aspect. And in fact, Chinese authorities, including the emperor, uh, tried briefly in the, in the earlier 19th century to 
uh, legalize opium growing in China itself as a way of alleviating the flow of money, the hemorrhaging of money back into Western pockets uh, for narcotics. This is a, a great moral uh, problem in, in history and it's something we can, we can come back to in, in a second. So, um, the, the, the emergence of America in a, as a major trading partner, the United States, uh, took place around about the 1850s. And it had a lot of cultural dimensions, which again I only want to just sketch in very, very briefly here, because they, they became important. That <coughs> essentially the United States became a kind of cultural mediator or cultural arbiter uh, with China in the 18th, 19th centuries. Part of this was religious, was a missionary venture, and one of the key moments in this passage was the translation uh, of the Bible into Chinese. And once this was done, a missionary work could go on much faster pace uh, in, the, in the Chinese language. Uh, and this led, of course, to uh, <coughs> more and more friction because the, between the Chinese and the Americans, because uh, the, the, the word of God was traveling as fast as it possibly could uh, by every kind of known means of transportation. You can read about boats full of Chinese language Bibles going inland uh, in Fujian province, for instance, in Zhejiang province, uh, and eventually in the Shanghai uh, region. So there was this cultural, religious side there was the formation and translation of, of the Bible. There was the construction of dictionaries of Chinese and uh, uh, English language. And then there was the development of school systems that used, uh, had a religious backing from home offices and yet began to explore new developments. <coughs> there was a time of sort of a sparring match on opium uh, imports into China through the 19th century. Uh, but it was never eradicated completely, uh, and, the, and it began to now be uh, bitterly attacked by uh, evangelists in, in both the United States and in Europe. Then I think the last thing I mention is that the ending uh, of the of the Chinese and uh, in terms of American interconnections was fairly painless. So the, the Chinese Revolution is often linked to the uh, 1911, uh, what the Chinese call the Xinhai Geming, the, the, the sort of revolutionary turmoil <coughs> of, the, of that period. But in here we find many, many uh, gestures from the West, and particularly from the United States, to help uh, China form a new, a new government. Dr. Sun Yat-sen, uh, had lived for a long time in the United States. And uh, philosophers and, and uh, intellectual leaders like uh, Liang Qichao, uh, that still studied in, in China, uh, they were often uh, sort of mediating or brokerage uh, mediating between uh, Western values and Chinese values. But they were also trying to create a new sort of synthesis in China. And that synthesis included uh, democratic structures uh, and reform uh, in, in, in law and in government and in representation. And this, uh, these ideas of representation, law, uh, the parliamentary systems and so on, they, they, they began to create an entire new vocabulary as part of this interchange. And I like to think that that is in fact part of a civilizing process that did uh, persuade the Westerners but eventually uh, to stop the opium sales, at least on that large scale, uh, and to begin to look more practically uh, at the challenges of government uh, and organization. Well, where are we now in the, in the last few moments? Uh, because it was meant to be past, present, and future. Uh, I'll just say that we, we come here into the territory uh, where the experts are going to be speaking to the rest of the symposium. Um, China now is, is, is completely fascinating and very hard to, uh, to understand in all its levels. To guess which uh, aspect is going to be dominant, uh, I think is, 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 is very risky, uh, even for academics with a free pulpit. We can't be, we can't be quite sure. We can see uh, the really extraordinary mix of things that have 
happened in China that have involved uh, deals with the Soviet Union in the Korean War, um, with Chinese education overseas, with uh, multiple training grounds in China using Western technological developments. Uh, we can see how uh, a new culture was born in China. Uh, that was the Chinese uh, phrase for it in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, we can see how China got frozen into a hostile uh, relationship with the states that uh, became, began festering during World War II uh, when America was a key uh, ally to China against the Japanese and that highly technical supercharged kind of nationalistic politics mixed with, uh, mixed with the kind of um, uh, the belligerence and the anti-Soviet Union that also dominated the thinking at the same time. Uh, all this made the, uh, made the 1950s uh, and the emergence as the, really the, the key power base uh, of Chairman Mao uh, was in that period of war uh, and reform and, and shock, uh, all of which were sort of coming together with Taiwan once again as uh, uh, being sort of peeled off by world history. Uh, into its own into its own existence. Where are we going now? Um, well, it was that I was f future was the word I was asked to address. Uh, dangerous business for historians to be in. Uh, what is what is China's future? Uh, I'll just sketch. I mean, I'll, I'll just make three three guesses of where we're going. Uh, one is going to be in the future. In China is going to be sea power. Uh, the naval uh, development of, of, of Chinese <coughs> Navy, uh, the recent purchase of an aircraft carrier, uh, China's own submarine uh, industry and, and, and skill, uh, all of these things are now beginning to happen. And with them, uh, a whole range of problems which I think we could never have guessed at. Maybe all of you could have done, I couldn't have done. Uh, what sort of thing was going with this kind of, of change? Well. One was opening up the oceans of the world in, in a completely new way, I think, for China's experience across time. Uh, so sea trade, uh, if, if we tend to be a sort of cutting maniac, which I rather am looking at for snippets of information, uh, suddenly they start to fall into some kind of a, a relationship, a pattern. Uh, and one of these is the way that China has, in the last five years, has been probing, just fairly steadily, but probing uh, for different developmental areas on the globe uh, where the United States might not be uh, quite uh, as, as alert as we might think. Uh, one of these is Chinese interest in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, if you can sail steadily north of Russia, uh, if the seas uh, melt uh, much earlier, uh, if the whole pattern of tidal change uh, is, is underway, then the Chinese can be poised to move from their own uh, northeastern frontiers uh, above uh, Korea uh, and just south of Russia uh, and, and develop a naval a power and naval connection with uh, Scandinavian f uh, ports and so on. It's in, if you have a, a map of the world in your head, at least that is one side of this. It's a, it's, a, it's a question of thinking of new markets, new areas, new kinds of, of development. Chinese Navy has invested major amounts of money uh, in Western Pakistan uh, harbors, for instance. That puts China very well near uh, the Persian Gulf and the great oil producing country. For the first time ever, now to my great delight a few months ago, I was asked to give a talk in Greece. Uh, that was not my strong point. Uh, but I did learn from my hosts uh, that uh, it was only a few weeks before that China had bought the rights uh, to the Piraeus Harbor at Athens. Uh, and so China is now running part of the world's greatest old classical uh, center of trade. Uh, and the uh, profitability has been turned around completely uh, in the Piraeus Harbor. It's now making a lot of money for the Chinese investors, uh, and it's also causing major trouble uh, with union and other organizations in Greece. So right then, I don't think we could have guessed at that kind of problem with Chinese managerial staff sitting in Athens running uh, Chinese managerial uh, teams 
uh, to develop one of the world's oldest harbors. So Pakistan, Greece, the Arctic, uh, and in Africa, everywhere in Africa, you will see Chinese interests, Chinese uh, uh, work. Uh, I was in Beijing for the Welcome Africa year, just before the Olympics, an amazing uh, Chinese outpouring of interest, expressed interest at least, in the development of Africa as a potential. And then finally there is the entire world of, of Chinese uh, technical skills. Uh, we, we call it by the, the, the brief sort of shorthand of, of cyber, uh, cyber warfare or cyber competition. This is clearly something that's coming to, to stay, I think. And if it's not done domestically and industrially, then it's going to be done nationally or internationally. And again, China is very well poised through their educational skills uh, to develop a very strong uh, intellectual kind of force in that way. So with that, just as, as quick suggestions of where we might go, uh, I'll welcome all the questions if you have them, and then we'll move on to the panelists uh, who really know what they're talking about. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> for sharing your insights on the relationship between West and China, its past, present, and the future. If we look at this map, we can see how big China is, how enormously powerful it is in terms of economic size. Some of its provinces are as big as many well-known countries. And I think that greatness of China was really captured very well by Dr. Spence. Uh, we have a few more minutes for question. We have about 10 minutes. So we would open the floor for question. David Ives has a microphone, so if any of you have a question, please uh, uh, state your question and please be brief. If we look at Chinese trading today, there seems to be a sort of bloom off the rose in the sense that American companies are afraid that their intellectual property won't be protected in China. And this has caused some companies not to want to build products there because they're afraid that it'll get pirated. I just want to maybe you could comment on this as a force in modern economic uh, trading with China. Well, I, all I can do is, uh, is, is acquiesce in saying it's, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, the level of sort of general reportage. I haven't done a, a specific study of this. There is deep uh, worry, but that, you know, intellectual piracy goes on in, in many in many areas. So it's a question of what particular aspect of Google's policy or others that might be might be the most crucial now. Um, I don't see I don't see much chance of of all those loopholes closing. Uh, and I think pressures might be strong on, on Chinese companies uh, to uh, follow their own government's ad advice about individual uh, opportunities here, uh, but I'd have to leave that to uh, those who are experts on uh, such matters. I'm, I'm not, I'm afraid, and I, I don't uh, understand my own computer, let alone other people's. Uh, but it, the question is completely valid, and uh, does anybody want in fact, to comment on it? Because this is a symposium, we're starting off here. Does anybody have feelings uh, or personal experiences that you could share? Uh, the, 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 the rev I mean, in scholarship, we find it's colossal because of Chinese retrieval systems and so on. It's it's study of classical Chinese, uh, the putting, well, as you're doing here in Quinnipiac, the digitalization of huge amounts of information. China is, is doing that and will continue to do that and has the intellectual training to continue uh, doing that. Uh, <coughs> Going back to the past for a minute, would you comment a little bit about post-World War II uh, American and perhaps British relationships with China as the revolution in China was developing? Yes, I mean, I can, I can try. It's a, it's a deeply interesting uh, period. <coughs> the whole relationship in World War II, the different forces with <coughs> the, the mixture of American air power, American uh, land power, under General Chenault and uh, Stilwell, uh, 
and then the, fight, the battling of within the American system with Chiang Kai-shek and the, and the nationalists. So you've got the nationalist struggle with the communists in North China, and then the, and then the internal struggles going on at the same time. Um, it seems looking back, I mean, it's, as, as one looks back, one kind of keeps shaking one's head at the, uh, at the triviality of some of these problems and the pettiness of some of the uh, arguments, but also the issues ran very, very deep and they affected the whole future uh, of the Chinese uh, political system. Um, and so, uh, c certain senior American officers, uh, I, I think with m military logistical right on their side, uh, suggested that, of course, the people who should be armed by Americans were the communists. Uh, by about 1944, it seemed to me that the communist base areas were putting up more resistance to Japan uh, than, uh, than others. This looking backwards, we might see we were slightly misled or massively misled and uh, it caused grave uh, splits in the American armed forces of people like General Wedemeyer on one side and um, uh, I, I was thinking of um, um, Stilwell's um, nemesis, uh, people like Davis and, and service, uh, the American Foreign Service officer, uh, all of this drove the, the, the tensions in, in very deep. Um, there are also sort of psychological factors that are very hard to calculate from outside. Um, a, gr a small group of scholars, and, uh, uh, I've only read some of their works, I haven't asked them about this, but have pointed out that one of the strange mysteries at the end of World War II, and I think this would fit your, your question, is why you know, in late 1945, why did the Chinese not keep Hong Kong? Uh, just, uh, you had very, very large uh, Chinese armies now being redirected from the, north, the southwest in China and from the Burma campaigns from India. Uh, from Western China, uh, and there was a kind of a gap. There was a kind of a short period uh, in which uh, the British uh, Raj or the British Imperial System, if you like, was so weakened by by World War II that it really was totally ineffective. I think, in, uh, and yet uh, when Hong Kong, with only a, uh, less than one battalion uh, of British troops, so probably only be about maybe four or five hundred troops at the most. Um, at times they were holding, holding Hong Kong when Chiang Kai-shek was reallocating as many as uh, uh, 100,000 uh, troops from various parts of, of what had formerly been the Chinese battle area. <coughs> I think part of the problem seems to have been that there was no, no consciousness yet that such a thing was possible. Uh, we have to sort of get a sense of something being possible until we can roar away with it and, and start developing it. But <clears throat> Hong Kong was British, uh, and so it was a way station for Chinese troops, but it wasn't a place to be just cocking your rifles and saying, OK, uh, let's end this, let's end this uh, historical show that's gone on since 1839. Use the centennial if you want to, <clears throat> and then say uh, Hong Kong is, is ours, it always has been. Uh, now it should go back. That uh, is not the way things happen. Uh, but the, the why uh, of that is, is, is intersected with Cold War thinking of various kinds uh, and the move to, uh, to Taiwan. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tangle. Uh, and American domestic politics are very central to this, this tangle. The other name I was trying to recall, of course, is, 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 is General Marshall. Uh, so that Marshall, uh, as, as uh, uh, leader of, of the, the armed forces and later as a very influential force in, in uh, reconstruction in Europe, uh, Marshall trying to negotiate aloud, as it were, uh, enables us to trace some of the, uh, the complexities of that. But it's, uh, the tensions ran very deep uh, and the world was complicated. There was Shanghai to be repossessed. There was the, uh, the ending, which had already happened, of the, uh, the unequal treaty system, the, uh, the changes in, in legal structures. All of these were being worked on uh, in the 1940s. Um,
how that sort of glides into the Korean War is another very difficult uh, problem. It was a close call uh, about not, I mean, obviously Mao uh, seems to have been very uneasy about that war. There was a resistance, I think, among the various communist leaders about you know, what exactly uh, was going on uh, here and what was Stalin. It, it gets us into Cold War international politics of a very complicated kind. But it's an old battle uh, and it, in different guises there's still a, lo a lot of tension. But there's now massive collaboration of course as well, economic and in other areas between uh, nationalist China and uh, mainland China. And that hasn't been solved. There are too many factors maybe for it ever to be solved by a single legal decision or something like that. The best way seems to be to gradually get more and more movement between the two uh, entities and, and see how the investment patterns work. It goes to the intellectual property side as well through, through Taiwan. Thank you, Dr. Spence. I know there are many other people who would like to ask questions, but uh, due to time constraint, unfortunately, we will have to bring this session to an end because we have another uh, panel discussion that will start right after this session. So let us thank Dr. Spence for your